My father would be proud and my mother would believe you. <laughs> Those kind compliments. So um, as Peter mentioned, I'm, I'm going to take us through some of um, the journey that we've had with PET here at the Institute and then talk a little bit about the future. And along the way, I'm going to use uh, some quotes from things I would often hear from uh, Dr. Don Beanlands uh, that have inspired me along the way. These are my disclosures. Um, and I'll begin with the quote that when I was a boy from Mark Twain, I was a boy, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stand to have him, the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished how much the old man had learned in seven years. <laughs> and certainly, um, as I get older, I, I, I realize and understand the wisdom of, of DSB. So we're going to talk a little bit really briefly about the basics of PET and briefly on the disadvantages and advantages. Uh, focus on the mapping the myocardium, uh, a lot about metabolism and the work we've done there and flow and ischemia and microvascular function. I'm not going to, for, for sake of time, I'm not going to talk about neurohormonal function very much. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about inflammation of the myocardium and the vasculature. We'll look at new paradigms and concepts and tracers, including comparative effectiveness and some frameworks for future studies. And as I mentioned, a focus on lessons learned from DSB. So lesson number one, so today's research brings tomorrow's patient care. And I, I like to show this slide is a slide from 1965. Um, I show it for a few reasons. One, it is um, a fusion image. So it's a fusion of a chest X-ray with a rectilinear scanned image of uh, radioiodinated fatty acids. And it's said to be the first metabolic imaging of the heart. Um, so at that time, people are thinking of structure and function integration. The, um, and as I mentioned, the first metabolic imaging. I, I show it for another reason, um, as it's actually uh, one of my father's first papers, Don Beanland. So he, he was um, uh, one of the people doing this study. And it, it also is probably the first international imaging collaboration. Uh, so what happened was that the, these, were, these were images in dogs, and the dogs were injected with the radiated fatty, fatty acid in Toronto, anesthetized, put in the trunk of a car, and driven to Buffalo, New York, across the border, and then imaged uh, on the rectilinear scanner that was in there, which didn't exist in Toronto in 1965. Um, anyways, so we've come a long way since then. So. Yesterday's research is now tomorrow's treatment, and in fact, we can now routinely look at perfusion imaging, function, uh, quantify flow, and we can fuse this now with CT and with MR to get better structure, structure and function interaction relationships. So to go on to PET, what is PET? So PET is positron emission tom tomography. We begin with a radioisotope nucleus that emits a positron a positively charged electron that collides with an electron and the two annihilate and create um, two gamma photons at equal and opposite directions. Um, so a positron is actually antimatter. So that's kind of pretty cool, actually. Um, anyhow, so you get the annihilation and you get these coincidence photons. And it's that coincidence photons that allow PET to do what it can do. That is to precisely localize the event between um, two detectors and on opposite sides of the target organ, in our case, the heart. Uh, and so because of that, we can quantify biological processes. Uh, we can create uh, images that have superior accuracy. And um, we can measure and track these molecular and functional processes. The disadvantages of PET, however, is the access and the cost, the resolution, um, it depends a lot, not always, on a cyclotron. It does have some radiation. And some would say that we're doing basically hammer and nail type research. So we have a problem and then we take the PET camera or the hammer, we try to solve it. But the cost is, is coming down and there are low cost options and Rob DeKemp has been working on these. Uh, you can also get super resolution PET and you can add, combine as I showed you, PET with MR or CT to enhance the, uh, the resolution of the information we're getting. Uh, 
Um, we're not completely dependent on cyclotrons. We can use generator tracers such as rubidium and more recently gallium. And F-18 tracers can now be shipped um, several hours distance from the, the site of uh, production at the cyclotron. The radiation is actually quite low, less than two millisieverts, just a little over two to two and a half mammograms as the equivalent. And uh, with the ham mirror nail research, I'd say uh, working as teams and with people trying to solve problems, we can use PET to help solve those issues. So PET in Canada. So this is where PET cameras and cyclotrons exist in Canada. Actually, cardiac PET started in Hamilton. They were the first ones to do PET. We quickly uh, adopted that and developed that. And now PET is, uh, cardiac PET is being done in several centers in Canada and Vancouver, I understand, is soon to be joining the, the fold. So now moving to uh, metabolism and remodeling of the myocardium. So we're focusing on FDG, which is a, a glucose analog that moves into the cell parallel to glucose, gets converted to, glucose gets converted to glucose 6-phosphate, FDG to FDG 6-phosphate, but there it's trapped. And because it's trapped, we can now image the glucose utilization of the myocardium, but also of any cell that's utilizing glucose, including inflammatory cells. So lesson two from DSB. So whenever I had something uh, big happen to me, I accepting into medical school, accepting into residency, passing my Royal College exam, starting on staff at the Heart Institute, DSB would always say, congratulations, the hard work has just begun. Uh, so indeed, we had a lot of hard work to get to where we are. And this is a, a pathway of the journey for FTG PET. So in 1992, uh, Terry Ruddy actually f uh, wrote the first proposal for, uh, for PET in Ottawa. Um, and at that time, I was in Michigan under the tutelage of Marcus Schweiger. Uh, when I returned, we quickly developed a collaboration with Ernie Fallon and McMaster. And then in, in 94, we actually got our first PET camera, which was a low-end PET camera. It was essentially a, um, a partial ring uh, PET camera. It wasn't the full, full uh, circle. And uh, but so because of that, it was much less expensive. And with this, we were on our way. We actually had our first, the first PET publication in Canada, cardiac PET, uh, or at least FTG PET publication, uh, came from us um, in the AGC in 97, showing that you could impact decision making with FTG. Uh, we followed this by a CFI application for which we were successful, which allowed us to purchase a cyclotron and a new PET camera. The cyclotron was installed in 2002, um, and then this uh, was followed by, or in parallel, we published uh, uh, what would be considered a seminal paper, the PAR2 trial, uh, which I'll go over uh, with you shortly. Following this, um, the uh, Ontario government uh, finally recognized after our first application in 93, so it took many, many years but they finally recognized both cardiac and oncology FDG PET as insured services with the Ministry of Health. Um, our own production of FDG was approved by Health Canada in 2011. And then from that point on, we've used expanded its use, not just for hibernation, but for sarcoid imaging, enterocarditis, device infection, and plaque imaging. So one of our earliest papers was to apply this in patients who are awaiting revascularization for bypass surgery. And what we noted that was that if people had hibernation uh, uh, de detected on PET imaging, if they waited more than six weeks, they had significant mortality. So this was not an innocuous process. Uh, but if we were able to operate on them early, none of these patients died. Furthermore, for those who waited, they did not gain the outcome benefit um, that they would have if they were operated on early. So their LV function did not improve. So this contributed to the understanding of hibernation as, a, as an active detrimental process to the myocardium that would either lead to scar or potentially lead to um, potential lethal arrhythmias or death, cardiac death from other causes. Um, so on that basis and on uh, an earlier study called PAR1, or we created the, the model construct to predict uh, recovery, we, we did PAR2. And PAR2 is a randomized trial, um, actually one of the first cardiac imaging randomized trials uh, 
uh, ever conducted. Um, uh, 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 Pam Douglas would have uh, used to say that promise was the first of its kind that way, but in fact, uh, she has recently recently corrected herself that PAR2 was, uh, was an imaging a directed randomized trial. So what happened was there was 430 patients with reduced LV function that were randomized to have FDG PET to use to direct therapy versus not having FDG PET available. And what we showed at one year and then later at five years was that there was a trend for outcome benefit when patients uh, and physicians were using PET for decision making. Um, one problem we had though was that fully a quarter of patients, the physician and patient did not follow was actually recommended by PET. So when we excluded those patients from the analysis, we could demonstrate an outcome benefit. Uh, in other words, when patients adhered and physicians adhered to the recommendations from imaging, you could achieve outcome benefit when PET was applied. We also looked at our own local data. Uh, this was called the Ottawa 5 sub-study uh, because all the other centers that were using PET at the time were oncology centers using cardiac PET, whereas we were focused on cardiac and we had a team-based approach that involved the imaging physician, the um, heart failure specialist, the cardiac surgeon, the interventional cardiologist, and we would give the information. It wasn't formalized the way the teams are now, but we would share this information between the groups uh, to try to create the best decision for the patient. So in that setting, you can see that when we use PET to direct therapy, we were able to achieve outcome benefits. So outcome benefit with FTG PET directed management at a center with access, experience, and integration with heart failure and surgical interventional teams can achieve outcome benefit. So along came the STITCH trial, and you may have heard of the STITCH trial, which was a 1,200 patient study a randomizing people with ventricular dysfunction who were candidates for revascularization to either have uh, revascularization by bypass surgery or not, or medical, by optimal medical therapy. And we've learned that after 10 years, there was outcome benefit from surgical revascularization. The, the viability sub-study, on the other hand, uh, was only about half of the patients. They weren't using viability to select the patients. Uh, they were just using viability imaging. And they did not show, um, if you actually look closely at the data, they did show that viability, when it was present, the patients who had revascularization benefited, but they weren't able to show that that was different than those who did not have viability. Um, but there were problems. So it's important to know that in STITCH, the patients were already accepted or had to be acceptable for revascularization. Whereas in PAR2, we were dealing with patients where revascularizations were more difficult, decisions were more difficult. Although STITCH was randomized, the viability substudy was not, whereas PAR2 was. The patients in STITCH were, in the STITCH viability substudy were younger. Fully 25% had single vessel disease. Only 7.5% had renal dysfunction compared to one third in the PAR2 trial. Only 3% had previous bypass compared to almost a fifth in the PAR2 and they use less sensitive means for detecting viability. That is with um, uh, perfusion, MIBI and uh, thallium imaging, which were the dominant uh, technologies, as well as dobutamine echo. They did not use PET or MR, which are now recognized to be the most sensitive mechanism, me methods. So it, it meant that we still needed more studies in this uh, area, uh, looking at ischemia and viability and LV dysfunction. And so we've conducted image heart failure, which has been actually several randomized trials, and I'll talk about a couple of them later. Uh, the one related to this group of patients were those, um, uh, was the 1A study, and this has been, this is actually completed enrollment. We're now into the follow-up phase and we're cleaning the data, so hopefully we'll soon have information that will look at this patient, these patients with LV dysfunction, where the question is about ischemia or hibernation comparing SPECT, MR, and PET uh, in a randomized cohort and a registry cohort looking at a composite clinical outcome. And this is being led or co-led by Lisa Milichuk here and Eileen O'Meara in Montreal. We've also looked at recently uh, in, a, in a subset of patients, a small subset of patients who underwent hibernation imaging 
Um, this is Jason Selt, uh, MD, PhD student, uh, working with um, Peter and myself and uh, Lisa, and showed that in patients with hibernating myocardium of more than 10%, these patients had significantly increased BNP and troponin, suggesting that there is a link between the pathophysiology and perhaps there may be a pathway whereby you can use biomarkers in combination with imaging to help with uh, improved decision making. So in summary around the viability, this is a, a nice review article written by uh, Rena Kandelin and Chris, um, Christiane Weifels, uh, uh, basically summarizing where we're at with the data around this, uh, who should be considered or not considered for viability testing. So in general, when patients are younger, where they're, um, uh, they have uh, HEFREF with predominantly angina, where they already have dem demonstrable ischemia, um, where their LV function is only mildly impaired, where they may have left main disease, or where they have no or limited comorbidities, clearly these patients, the decision for revascularization is relatively straightforward. You don't need viability imaging to help you. On the other hand, as when patients are older, when they have predominantly heart failure symptoms, when they have large, fixed, persistent defects without much ischemia, when they have poor LV function in some patients with total occlusions, and when they have multiple and severe comorbidities, those patients where the decisions are more difficult, viability imaging may be of use. So we do know that it's not needed in all patients. We must integrate it with all clinical information. And it seems to be most useful in the highest risk patients where decisions are more, are more difficult. In the future, I think we need to address whether biomarkers or neurohormonal imaging or other imaging modalities can help define which patients best benefit from image-guided therapies. Um, the other area of metabolism that, the, we, that we've looked at is in cardiac energetics in patients with heart failure. Um, and we use the tracer called C11 acetate, which is um, basically, it's a two-carbon molecule that uh, transports right into the mitochondria, goes through the TCA cycle, and comes out of C11CO2. Uh, and this is tightly linked to oxygen consumption. So with this, we can get a, a, a pro, um, an estimate of the use of oxygen consumption in the myocardium. And we use the kinetics of C11 acetate, its washout rate, to give us that information. Basically the amount that's coming out as C11CO2. So when we combine this with measures of, of heart function um, and, and vo stroke volume, combined with measures of work such as blood pressure and heart rate, and we correct for our K-mono, that's the washout rate constant, we can get a measure of cardiac energetics that we've called the work metabolic index. And we've used this to evaluate several different therapies um, at, the, at a time when beta blockers were not necessarily routinely used and trials were underway. Um, our data was helpful in supporting the concept that beta blockers may be useful. And you can see, in fact, that beta blockers improve the efficiency measured in this manner uh, compared to placebo in a group of heart failure patients. More recently, we've applied this in patients with um, uh, obstructive sleep apnea combined with heart failure. Um, we're uh, applying CPAP uh, to treat these patients. So in these patients, they have uh, issues of hypoxia and arousal that leads to both metabolic demand and sympathetic nervous system activation. We apply this concept of measuring their cardiac energetics um, and randomizing to have the CPAP therapy or not. And we're able to show in those with moderate to severe sleep apnea, that is greater than 10 episodes um, uh, per hour, uh, uh, they, these patients had significant improvement um, uh, with CPAP in terms of their cardiac energetics. And there's now, uh, based on this data and other data, there's now an ongoing trial um, uh, with uh, the Toronto group to, to look at the use of um, uh, sleep apnea uh, treatments um, with CPAP and, and more advanced forms of CPAP uh, in this population. So now moving on to flow and uh, ischemia and microvascular function. So um, early days, as with any investigators, we had a lot of uh, frustrating problems. We didn't get our first grants. No one would sell us rubidium generators. 
And Dr. DSB would say, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And so this is a story for rubidium. So we began by uh, identifying uh, triumph, and it kind of looks like Trump, the way it's written. <laughs> but, um, uh, and uh, in triumph, there was a, a, a physicist named John Vincent. He was actually shipping generators to Russia, okay? Um, and he actually didn't know how they were using the generators. They would send him back pictures. He didn't know if they were humans or if they were animals, but they were using the, the generators. And uh, uh, Rob and I took, uh, and, and truthfully, the, the Nordion, or nobody would actually sell us uh, rubidium in Canada. They, uh, they wouldn't let us cross the border and so on. So we went and visited John, and he was, he was making these generators in this, kind of looked like a garage, uh, his lab, um, and then sending them off to Russia. So we basically brought them uh, back here and took that technology um, and cleaned it up uh, and made it such that we could actually give uh, the tracer to patients. And Rob developed some specific new, tech, new techniques for actually milking the generator and the use of the column that, that, that was used, as well as a means to infuse it. Uh, so we did the first human studies of rubidium in Canada in 1997. And then from this, Rob developed a precision control dilution system, um, and we then licensed the technology to what was then uh, Draximage, now Jubilant Draximage. Um, this became registered uh, with Health Canada in 2009, um, and then uh, it was patented in the U.S. in 2010. Uh, we started uh, the Rubidium Army trial, which really began to disseminate the use of Rubidium in Canada uh, from that map I showed you earlier uh, across several centers in Canada. Uh, then the, the, the generator itself was approved in, in 2011, uh, and then FDA uh, uh, and, and the EU approved it in 2017. And finally, in uh, the end of 2018, the Ministry of Health of Ontario approved uh, new fee codes that recognize Rubidium PET as a distinct entity funded by the provincial government. Um, so we've been uh, active and part of that research process all the way along. We were the first site to publish on the prognostic value of perfusion PET imaging. Um, we were the first site to show the value of flow quantification um, to define multivessel disease. Uh, and we were the first site to show an outcome benefit for using flow uh, to predict adverse outcomes. Uh, sorry, the, the, using flow imaging with PET to predict adverse outcomes. So why do we want to measure flow? So flow, over, flow imaging overcomes shortcomings of relative PET and SPECT imaging, perfusion imaging. So when you look at a perfusion image, the, it's normalizing to a particular area that you assume to be normal. And the problem is that assumption is not always, nor, not always true. Uh, and in many of our patients with more significant disease, uh, it's often not true. So relative imaging doesn't allow us to do that, but flow quantification allows us to make that distinction. So flow can be more precise and more sensitive for diagnosis. It can define the physiological significance of a, of a stenosis. And it can also give us a, a window into the entire spectrum of disease, whether it be severe advanced diffuse coronary artery disease or disease in the microvasculature, which I'll show you in a moment. As I mentioned, it provides incremental prognostic value, both in coronary disease, but also in non-coronary disease states, and it has a potential direct therapy. So just to uh, uh, simplify some concepts here, we. You often hear about the measurement of, of FFR, which is fractional flow reserve, which is really actually a pressure measurement across the vessel. And it's really focused on the epicardial vessel and the epicardial stenosis. Whereas PET measures myocardial flow reserve, which is giving you the whole vascular bed. Um, and essentially is looking at the capacity of a vascular bed to maximize flow. And we use the reserve as a ratio of the stress flow over the resting flow in that given territory or in the whole heart. And so how this works is um, we begin with the generator and if you follow the green ball, it passes into the right ventricle, the RV blood pool appears 
passes through the lungs into the left ventricle, the LV blood pool appears, and then it gradually washes out of the blood pool and is taken up by the myocardium and we get our image here. And when we look at static imaging, it's only looking at this portion of the curve. All of the information of flow is happening in the first two to three minutes. And we can take this information and apply a mathematical models that will correct for the blood pool in red and the myocardium in blue to give us a true tissue uptake in the myocardium. And we can use the, the, um, the kinetics of this, the kinetic formula, the K1, which is the rate constant for uptake, uh, that is a directly related to myocardial flow. And that's how we're able to get flow measurements. So when we apply this, in this particular example, and um, Radhika was actually uh, working with us, uh, Radhika Parkish, who's now in Halifax, uh, who did the first study to look at rubidium as a means to diagnose multivessel disease. And then Cecilia did the prognosis study for, for outcomes um, in flow quantification. But what you see here is a relatively mild defect in the LED territory uh, that might be presumed to be single vessel disease. But when we quantify the, the rest, the stress, and the, and the stress over rest, or the flow reserve, we see the flow reserve is 1.12, normal being, or our low risk being greater than two. So this implies that there's severe global reduction flow reserve, and indeed this patient has um, significant stenoses in all three vascular territories um, that would not have been detected by the relative perfusion imaging alone. Um, as I mentioned, this is the, the first paper um, from, uh, from Radica that showed that the relative perfusion reserve, we, if we applied quantitative flow, um, we increased the amount of myocardium that was potentially abnormal and increased our ability to detect multivessel disease. So Cecilia did the, um, the outcome study looking at um, using the relative imaging, which is done by a, what we call a sum stress core, and you can see that when you added flow information, you could actually improve the ability to predict adverse outcomes when flow information was combined with uh, the relative imaging. Um, so to move on to the microvasculature, um, this is the, a normal cornea angiogram, but what you see here in this uh, beautiful post-mortem image is the wealth of um, microvasculature that exists in the myocardium. And this is, the, this is something that we cannot image, at least structurally. We can only measure its function, and this is how, where PET allows us to uh, dive into this, um, uh, this area. Um, so one of the areas that we've been interested in, in this particular area of, of uh, uh, measuring the microvasculature and the, the flow in the myocardium is in patients who are post-cardiac transplant uh, and you can see again this only only slight defects, almost pretty almost normal perfusion imaging in this patient. Uh, but when we f quantify the flow, the flow reserve was markedly reduced. Now, unfortunately, this patient died, but um, uh, we did have a postmortem examination, and what you what we were able to find was that in fact it confirmed that there was concentric intimal intimal thickening. Uh, and inflammation, which is consistent with this condition called cardiac allograft vasculopathy, which is a, a diffuse disease of the vasculature that, is, that cannot be uh, or is underestimated by large vessel cornea angiography. So PET allows us to potentially do that, and work with Sharon uh, has allowed us to show that PET has some incremental value in terms of um, uh, predicting the presence of uh, cardiac allograft vasculopathy, uh, particularly when it's measured using um, invasive measurements such as IVUS. Uh, and Sharon has developed this algorithm um, that whereby if the patient has uh, two out of three of, um, of either impaired flow reserve, impaired stress flow, or increased vascular resistance measured on PET, then these patients are likely to have CAV and should then undergo angiography and IVUS measurements. So some, flax, some facts on PET flow. So as I mentioned, um, FFR, the difference between FFR and 
and flow reserve, FFR was actually first validated using PET flow measurements. Um, uh, FFR complements um, PET, and it, in fact, it defines a discordant. PET allows the, the definition of discordant diffuse disease, where FFR can can make mistakes and underestimates the disease. PET flow has been shown, and I didn't go through these data, but it's shown to be the most accurate per patient ischemia diagnostic method, whether it's compared to SPECT, CTA, and even CTFFR in the recent Pacific trials. It has an incremental prognostic value, as I've shown. It can predict response to revascularization. Um, it, it can detect diffuse disease, microvascular dysfunction, and cardiac elevated grass vasculopathy. But what we don't have is randomized trials with PET flow versus other techniques. Um, so we still probably underestimate its full clinical value. And we are in the midst of designing such a trial uh, in collaboration with the Boston Group where we will compare PET flow and CTFFR, which is a newer technology. Moving on now to uh, inflammation. Um, so lesson number four and five um, from DSB was the best teacher is your patient. Uh, and way back when uh, he often would say a young person with new complete heart block has cardiac sarcoidosis until proven otherwise. Um, and so even way back then, before we, we started looking at sarcoid, uh, this was his mantra in, in patients presenting with complete heart block. And um, this is an example of such a patient, a 44-year-old man, uh, who actually was in Afghanistan at the time and had to um, be, uh, had had a syncopal episode and had to be brought home and was found to have third degree heart block. Uh, and you can see he underwent PET imaging uh, that there is focal FTG uptake in the left ventricle, the right ventricle, and interestingly also the atria. Um, the PET flow is actually fine, um, but you can see that there is FTG uptake in those same areas. Um, you can also see that the nodal uptake as well. Uh, so he uh, accepted to have an ICD put in, uh, ICD slash pacemaker, uh, but he refused to have steroids. And what happened was that the disease progressed and you can see now that there's actually perfusion abnormalities and there's more extensive FTG uptake and inflammation. Um, and this is uh, one example of how PET is being used in terms of following both diagnosis and follow-up. As it turns out, um, after this and after developing heart failure, he did go on steroids uh, and he also had a cardiac arrest. So thankfully he did have an ICD in place. Um, so we've been uh, able to show uh, early on, we did the first meta-analysis that also included our own data uh, uh, showing the potential accuracy of PET for detecting disease uh, as in using what were are now outdated Japanese criteria but showing good sensitivity of almost 90% and specificity almost 80% for detecting disease by the Japanese criteria. And with this, our data and others have been used to help define the guidelines about who should be screened for cardiac sarcoid, uh, where cardiac presentations can be the first or unrecognized manifestation. Um, and those would be patients with idiopathic advanced conduction disease uh, in young patients uh, under the age of 60 that's younger than me, um, and uh, showing almost a, a quarter to one third of these patients can have uh, cardiac sarcoidosis. When there's unexplained VT uh, and ARVC, which can be a mimicker of, of sarcoid, uh, especially when there's heart block present, and uh, uncommonly but still can occur in patients with heart failure. So our data over the years has helped to shape these guidelines and some of these uh, uh, numbers, these uh, rates are, are from the Heart Institute's uh, database. Um, we've also been investigating and been interested in developing new methods because FTG is not a perfect tracer. You have to take this ketogenic diet for 24 hours as well as a long fast um, before getting imaged. Uh, we've been able to use uh, fluorothymidine uh, which is a, a radionucleotide um, uh, that looks at cell prol proliferation. And you can see that in this particular example that the FLT is very similar to the FTG uptake uh, without um, a lot of extra activity um, 
uh, that, um, that can plague FTG PET. Uh, we've been able to show that there's actually a good correlation uh, between the two, and this may become a potentially useful uh, tracer in the future for this disease. Um, and likewise, as, with, as I talked about earlier, with many of the other studies that we've done, the imaging data has been used to help us inform the design of randomized trials, and uh, David Burney's trial, CASM-CS, um, is uh, an RCT um, that's comparing different approaches to therapy uh, in this uh, challenging group of patients. The other group that we've worked with is the Canadian Atherosclerosis Imaging Network. Uh, this is David Spent and Jean-Claude Tardif, who uh, with us uh, were co-leads on this network, which was uh, across Canada. Uh, there were uh, several th research themes, but the one that we were leading or co-leading was in vascular imaging um, uh, and technology assessment. Uh, the concept being that we can distinguish the stable plaque from the vulnerable plaque that's likely to rupture. Um, and this, this really is what we would like to be able to do uh, better and better. Uh, so we know that the thin, the thin fibrous cap, the lipid-laden plaque, and so on, are much more prone to rupture. As well, inflammation is a key part of this process. So our current paradigm is to treat the targets, the stenosis and the ischemia, but our potential future paradigm might be to, to target inflammation and lesions that are likely to rupture. And indeed, we've looked at this, this is in carotid imaging, uh, and shown that um, when we measure the samples from the carotid to look at inflammation measured by CD68 staining, it did have a relationship to FTG uptake. Um, uh, likewise, we were able to show that those who had uh, recent events had greater degrees of FTG uptake in their carotid arteries. Um, and this has led us to design uh, a randomized trial cadence, which is taking people with recent ACS uh, or recent um, cerebral events uh, undergoing inflammatory marker pre measurements as well as inflammation imaging in the carotids, the aorta, and as well the coronaries, randomizing them to colchicine versus placebo and looking at uh, um, imaging outcomes. And as people know, the recent Colcott study showed us that in patients who were post-infarct, that colchicine did appear to have some outcome benefits. So this will hopefully help us define which patients might be more likely to have at least a biological response to support um, therapy with this drug. Uh, Kevin has uh, actually been instrumental in the design, and Kathy and Chantel and Allison have been uh, working hard at getting this uh, study up and underway. We should be ready to go within the next couple of weeks. Um, we've also looked at sodium fluoride, which is a marker of microcalcification or active calcification, which is part of the atherosclerotic process. Um, and we're able to show that in, in the carotid, we had a similar um, uh, against tissue sampling, uh, able to show that there was a relationship between the stains for active calcification um, uh, versus the sodium fluoride uptake in, um, uh, in the vascular wall. And we are now exploring whether we can also do this uh, in, in collaboration with Juan Grau and, and Lara to look at whether we can do this also in the aortic valve. Um, uh, another area of interest has been uh, working with Katie uh, and the concept of the activation of the inflammasome that there may be specific targets um, that uh, uh, certain imaging agents such as those that bind to amyloid and amyloid being a protein in the inflammasome may allow us to actually image plaque and plaque inflammation uh, um, by this tracer uh, method. And uh, we have uh, submitted a protocol to investigate this. Um, uh, furthermore, uh, Ben has been working on other tracers in the in involved inflammation, and specifically MMP13, uh, where he has uh, synthesized this and will be looking at um, this in animal models and potentially applying this in humans in the near future. So moving on to some future aspects, imaging, um, cost effectiveness and personalized medicine, as well as AI. So DSB always said that he has always practiced personalized medicine for his patients. Um, 
So in terms of looking at comparative effectiveness, um, I mentioned image heart failure early. Well, two parts of image heart failure have already been completed. Uh, the first was led by Ben Chow, where we looked at the use of CT angiography in patients with heart failure, randomizing them to have CTA or invasive angiography, and we're able to show um, that in about in almost 250 patients, that um, the initial cost for CT was lower. Uh, the total costs were actually similar, and that CTA uh, compared to ICA um, with in patients with heart failure was not more expensive, and did not lead to greater clinical events and you reduce the use of invasive angiography uh, by as much as 77%. So it could be a considered approach in patients with a heart failure where your question is to define the anatomy. Furthermore, um, uh, led by Ian Patterson and uh, uh, Quan Chan being the senior uh, author, uh, an MR and an echo expert, uh, we did a randomized trial comparing routine versus selective cardiac MRI in patients with non-ischemic heart failure. And what we showed was that over time, there was an increase in uh, specific heart failure etiology diagnosis, but there was not a difference when you compared the two approaches, um, suggesting that using an echo first strategy and selective use of MR would be a reasonable approach to undertake. Uh, and this has uh, been, is now EPUB ahead of print in circulation. Um, with this structure and with the other um, biomarker research, uh, it has led us to uh, set up a, a construct for image-guided therapy compared effectiveness projects where we're looking at specific risks and symptoms, uh, evaluating health priorities and trajectory, looking at one approach compared to another, which may involve a biomarker, um, artificial intelligence, and so on, the treatment applied, treatment received, and then looking at outcomes. Um, so we do need to have effective use of imaging to improve outcomes, and this is really a societal imperative. We need to compare novel strategies for imaging, identify some entirely new concepts, such as the biomarker use to define imaging as a new paradigm for cardiovascular, for patients with cardiovascular disease. And we do need to personalize this, um, uh, even if we do personalize our care for our patients, um, uh, personalize the identification of individual patients' phenotype, their likely response to treatment, and their personal health priorities and health trajectory. So uh, just to move on briefly, conceptually as um, one of the areas of interest, and I don't claim to be an expert, but I know that this is something that we are trying to focus on at the Institute, um, that there is a potential for AI to be applied and help improve um, how we diagnose and, and uh, manage patients. So if you imagine um, we want to find a way to choose which test for the patient, we can implement, we can input demographic, clinical, ECG, and other lab informations um, potentially through a personal device, apply artificial intelligence to then have a decision support workflow to prioritize, schedule, or protocol it. Um, then apply, in this case, a perfusion test, for example, and then use the image variables, again, applying artificial intelligence to, to best uh, make the diagnosis and provide this back to the patient and the physician to better improve treatment. So we're not there yet, but this is something that's being actively explored and I think is, is worth the investment if we can improve care for our patients. So what's next for imaging in PET and in cardiovascular disease? So we, imaging adds value if it, if it is accurate, if it leads to action on the part of the, uh, the physician and the patient, and that action impacts outcome. And that's what we always must be thinking about when we're applying imaging. We do need to redefine the role of imaging in the care continuum. Uh, that is, which patients are most likely to benefit from image guiding therapy, uh, specifically in, in PET, uh, the role of biomarkers, the microvasculature and inflammation. Uh, in particular, there we are interested in. And we need to focus on value-based imaging, in other words, achieving high-quality imaging evidence with uh, well-constructed comparative and cost-effectiveness trials that are well-powered and really answer whether imaging does impact outcomes, quality of life, or costs.
we need to continue to work on integrating structure and function uh, mapping and, Im and integrating imaging uh, in a more consolidated way in how we make decisions with uh, hard team approaches as well as answer questions around artificial intelligence and enhancing accuracy in decision making to improve outcomes. So um, final lesson from DSB, the keys to success are enthusiasm, enthusiasm, and enthusiasm. He also said to remember the patient, so we need to put our patients first, and uh, remember mentorship, find great mentors and heed their advice and mentor others. And also to work in teams, surrounding ourselves with great uh, people and people who are fun to work with who share common goals. Uh, and I've been fortunate to be able to do that. Uh, this is our division. Um, uh, and I, I'm grateful for all of their support. I would not be up here today were it not uh, for a supportive division and division structure. Um, this, is from la this is from 2018, and this is from 2019. You see Mirdad, I don't know, he somehow always gets to the front there. Um, I also want to acknowledge all of the people, the, um, my imaging colleagues, other collaborators, uh, George Wells and his team, um, all of our research uh, coordinators and all of the trainees that I've had the pleasure to work with. Um, uh, these are, are um, uh, many of them here. Uh, some of these faces you'll be familiar and many have gone on to uh, have uh, careers of their own uh, and be successful researchers uh, impacting um, patient care and so on. Uh, likewise, I've been fortunate to have Great support from Linda, Allison, and Carrie, who are behind the scenes uh, helping and uh, completely dedicated to, uh, to our success. Um, I've been also particularly, I, I, I can't single out every patient, every person in the division, but I do want to highlight the more recent recruits um, who I've been excited to work with uh, and uh, motivate uh, me and others to continue to work harder and strive for, um, for more discoveries and improving research and care. Uh, and finally, these four individuals with whom I've, I've not published um, more papers than with any of the, these four I've published the most with, except for one person, I think you know who that is, um, uh, Rob DeCamp, who has been uh, my brother in arms uh, over the years uh, and to whom I'm extremely grateful and we would not be here without uh, our, our collaborative uh, efforts. Uh, and finally, my own mentors in my younger days, uh, Peter, actually my first paper was published with Peter, uh, Marcus Schweiger, and I mentioned Ernie Fallon and Hamilton, we couldn't have gotten off or a start uh, without him, and Lyle Higginson, who um, in the early days, uh, we took a, a road trip to Montreal and visited the Montreal Neurological Institute to find out what a pet center really looked like. Um, and really helped us to get off the ground. Uh, and finally, my greatest mentor of all, oh, of course, my dad, um, which is the, I attribute the lecture to, um, and his legacy, um, his great-grandchildren, um, as well as his contribution here, of course, and then my greatest mentor of all, Jenny. Thanks.